Ms. Gazelonis? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Ms. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. And I think 
Some of you may have on your agenda that Project Race was going to make a contribution tonight. They're unable to do that. So if you have it on your agenda, just take it off. Oh, yes, one adjustment. <laughs> Are there any public comments on the agenda items? Seeing none, we will close the public session. 6.0, new business, and what we're going to do this evening uh, in order to move things along because of the lengthy workshop section is we're going to take a look at 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and 6.4 in order to take them all at once. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions on any of these? Okay. All in favor? Good, we have six plus one, and I was absent. <laughs> so, one absentee. And then 6.5, the mix and mingle waiver fee for the Wentworth cafeteria. And we do have a speaker here this evening. Do you have any questions? That's all I want to ask. So, Jane, we have a couple of new board members. Could okay. you explain, just stand to the mic so folks can hear you and just explain a little bit about what a mix and mingle is? And Mix and mingle is a Western Square Dance Club that has been in existence uh, on its own for since 2009, but before that there were three clubs together that combined. So square dancing itself has decreased in popularity. You didn't even know it existed, right? <laughs> um, but it's still alive and well, and we have it here in Scarborough. So during the year, um, Western Square Dance consists of a, about 60 moves that you need to learn and then you can go to any square dance anywhere in the world, because they all call in English, and you know participate, walk in as a total stranger, and walk in and have a good time in square dance. But we do need to have these lessons, so during the school year, we have lessons starting in September, and we go on for about 30 weeks. We're gonna, have, we're gonna be graduating our tiny little class on May 3rd, uh, but and the regional New England convention is this weekend actually in Stowe, Vermont. So we keep happy people off the streets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 40 people uh, that are full members, which means people who have gone through the class and graduated and just start dancing anywhere, anytime. And Jane, you make the contribution to the school district as yes, point we do. blanket, or do, the, do you separate it by schools? Or we ask for waivers for two schools. Uh, for Wentworth, we have a Saturday evening dance once a month during the school year. We have to go someplace else in February and April because ours is usually the third Saturday, and school vacation gets mm -hmm. in the way now. Uh, in so we usually ask for the waiver for the use of the hall, but we certainly expect to pay, pay the custodial fees because obviously it's a Saturday. Um, the custodian is at a corner school every Thursday. Uh, so what, in that case, we're asking for a use and custodian fee waiver. Okay. Are there any other questions from Jane? I think I told you this last year when you were here, but we used to, as part of our phys ed curriculum, have to take square dancing. I and did too. Did you? You guys <laughs> did too. Yeah. <laughs> like you had to. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Are you guys doing that nowadays? Yeah. yeah. So fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're showing our age now. <laughs> <laughs> it is good fun. And it was fun. It. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Well, come on down. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's Thursday nights, so you guys are pretty busy on uh -oh. Thursday yeah. nights. Yeah. <laughs> That would be much more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can have a motion on this, let's add the 6.5 and the 6. .5. Yes, Jack. Uh, I move approval of the waiver for mix and mingle for the 
Well, the first one's the Wentworth Cafeteria, so I will do that first. I just want to point out to folks that when this group started, they started in the basement of the Bessie School. And they were doing it, doing the, I don't know if it was called Mix and Mingles at the time. It but wasn't. It uh, was one of the other groups. They were doing square dance in, in the old gym at Bessie School when I was first elected to the school board. And when Bessie closed, they moved over to Wentworth. And uh, they've always been good stewards of our school. And uh, I We hear approved. compliments from the custodians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second. Okay, very good. Any other questions, concerns? All in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Jane. I guess we, oh, know we could where. do eight corners. She, her motion was just for Wentworth. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. And I move approval for the waiver for mix and mingles for the use of the eight corners multi-purpose room on Thursday evenings. Second. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? All in favor? 7.1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. 6.7 and 6.8, and once again, if we can take those together, let's see any objections on that. The middle school Hannaford donation, which was, let's see, Hannaford was for 966, or was that the 1401? 1401 is middle school. Okay, 1401 was the middle school, yeah. and 966 was high school, to the high school. school. And then 1200, so, I think, is to athletics. What was that from? Well, that's a separate um, one. They're both Hannaford donations. Those were the so, um, receipts that you right, got. That's, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Right. The school dollars. Hannaford mm -hmm. helps schools. They call yeah. the program. Mm -hmm. So they collect. So you the drop receipts. your receipt into the box at Hannaford, and then the school that you wrote on there gets the credit. So. Uh, I move yes. Yes, please. I um, move that we accept the Hannaford donations for both the middle school and the high school. With thanks. Thank you. Second. Second. Very good. Any questions? Concerns? No? All in favor? 7.1. Thank you. And now 6.9, the high school track and field donation. So this, um, recently the Scarborough High School Athletics received a check for the amount of $1,205 from Seth Albert, um, who is a Scarborough alum and the donation is being made to support the track and field at the high school. I didn't know, Mike, did you want to speak to the donation at all? Sure, do you mind coming to the podium for us and just... Is there a motion on the table? Move approval, of, move acceptance of the donation. Second. Okay, With so we have a thanks. second. Um, any questions? I do. So, so this is a really sizable chunk from a single person, Seth Albert. Yep. Um, and I see it's going into the Athletics Activities Fund for Future Use. What kinds of things, into the track and field, what kinds of things would be purchased with $1,200? I'm guessing that he is also our pole vault coach. Um, for track, and so I'm guessing that it would probably be something for the track program. Those determinations haven't been made yet. It's for equipment. Equipment, okay. Yeah. All right. Can I also mention yep. that uh, Seth, I believe, is currently a Unum employee. Yeah, and they, and they, and doing that match. gift will be matched, and, and Unum has a program where for, for public schools, or I guess for any school, they do a double match. And so, um, so it'll end up being, I don't know, $2,500 $2, or something. $2,500 more, yeah. Yeah. So Which about, is a little over 3000 I think. Wow. It's really substantial. Wow. And as long as we keep sending people to Unum to work, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of really generous Unum Please. Yeah, we have. Seth is a Scarborough grad, is that right? He is. He is, he is a Scarborough grad and came back and, and coaches for us now. Yep. Great. Super cool. cute. Great. Adult. Any other questions? Okay, we had a motion to second. All in favor of accepting this donation? 
Thank you. Seven plus one. Thank you. Is that something we could reach out to you and employees? Like just to we're, well, we're currently working with the police department and the fire department on a UNAM grant. Um, so they, they're constantly, they have a big philanthropic department, and I believe they also um, have a, first, a person who's specific to supporting yeah. schools. Um, is it Sharon? No, um, Carrie Olson. Carrie Olson. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, uh, Bob Mitchell, who is a former school board person, has, over the years, made substantial contributions and I still hit him up for the free <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner and because we have it at Wentworth and he makes the check his check out to Wentworth and Unum uh, makes the donation to the Wentworth school for the free Thanksgiving dinner and the, those donations have covered How much uh, I can only tell, I can't remember the exact amount, but I can tell you it covers the cost of what we pay uh, to the party shop for the linens, all the linens, mm -hmm. and, and the dishes, and the silverware, and they have given us a donation. They donate half for that activity also, the, the party shop. So now we have um, 7.0, 7.1, and 7.2 together. If, if you don't mind, the high school and the middle school spring coaches for approval. Is there a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions about these coaching positions? I just think it's always important to note that some of them are booster funded and some of them are actually volunteers. There are a lot of folks that give to our programs. Any other questions about this? Okay. All in favor of these spring positions? 7.1. Thank you. And now on to the workshop. All right. Thank you, Jane. That's awesome. All right. So I think tonight will be one of those nights that you gain a whole new or reinforced appreciation for DataWise. Kathy and Barb will be our facilitators again tonight for part two of our budget workshop. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we get started here tonight. Okay. So I just want to go over the norms. Um, we have our table tents. The take an inquiry stance, and so that's really important that you guys ask questions. Ground statements and evidence. Assume positive intentions. Stick to protocol and hear all voices. Start and end on time. We're going to really try that tonight and be here now and enjoy the learning. One that we added. And um, the ACEs, the uh, ACE Habits of Mind, will ground us in our work, uh, shared commitment to action, assessment, and adjustment, intentional collaboration, and a relentless focus on evidence. It's something to keep in mind as we work together. Thanks. And then I wanted to, the hard copy of the agenda you have is just today's agenda, but Julie, could you go back and, sh and go to the link of the... Um, running agenda. So the title of the slide deck. Oh, do you have to stand up? I think so. Okay. Go ahead. That's a link. That's a link to the agenda. And you'll see, Julie will scroll down. You'll see our agenda. Today's has been put to the top. And then if you scroll down, you'll see April 5th's agenda. Do we have, was that shared with us? Um, I believe so, I but so you know, my drive. you know what I can do? It is posted on the budget portal, but, oh, the new one. The new one, right? Okay. Not yet. Um, but I'll share that right now. Okay. And as far as the agenda goes, I will always add notes as we speak, so you can go back and take a look mm -hmm. at it. Uh, yeah. Notes. So, Julie is the facilitator. I'm the timekeeper today, and then 
Barb is taking the notes. So check-ins. Does anybody have anything that they need to share so that they can stay focused on this meeting here? Typically our check-ins are very short. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot of company. I think, I think we all are, company. Jackie. <laughs> Yes, 11.30 was a late night, but I do, I do just have one comment. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, thank Donna and Jody and Carrie for their courage and their strength last night. I think that was probably one of the hardest public hearings that any of us have witnessed or have participated in. And I'm amazed at how smart you are, how articulate you are, how passionate you are, and how you've been able to endure all of this um, complexity during this really tough time. So. I'm really proud and honored to be the superintendent in Scarborough and know that we have amazing school board members like you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so now let's just re um, go over the pluses and deltas from the previous meeting, remembering that deltas were things we would change in the future. Um, the format and the agenda worked well, at least at the start. We did tend to, we were taking more time as we went on. <laughs> Um, loved people loved the budget book. It was clear, readable. Everyone kept on data-wise track. At least we tried, and there was a K-12 perspective at the table on the fifth. Um, some changes or deltas. Um, add more time for each speaker and questions. Now that is one where, when I, Barb and I worked on the agenda for today. We added 10 minutes for questions instead of five, and we kept to the 10 minutes. And then we looked at our time, and it was 10 o'clock, and we're like, no, people are tired. <laughs> we had a long, and, and so <laughs> he helped us to get down to 9.30, but I think we're gonna try to beat that, too. Yeah. 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 And Joanne's one of the speakers for her <laughs> department, so. Next year, would you really have? We're relying on you. We gave her 10 minutes for three sections, so. Um, Joanne's from New York, she can talk to us. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, for next year, really looking at having this workshop the, the, not on the same day as the first reading, having it earlier, have shorter sessions spread out over time. It'll be interesting because tonight is a little bit more of a mini session. We can see how it feels and maybe do that next year for all of the departments. Um, having the materials ahead of time would have allowed everybody to digest it. Um, break presentations up by department or phase, and forward questions that come up to Kate or Julie. <coughs> okay, I'm good. So as we get into our work, you know we always like to start with our mission. Particularly, I find this important, uh, an important reminder when we're talking about the budget. Um, we want to be mindful of the bottom line while also thinking about how do we ensure that um, we stay true to our mission. And so here's why the Scarborough Public Schools exist in our mind. The fundamental purpose of the Scarborough Public Schools is to provide a safe and inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient, lifelong learner who is prepared to engage as a contributing member of society. And so I just ask that you keep that all close to your thoughts today as we learn more about our budget. And so here's our workshop goal for today. Kate, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that I'm visioning today as a continuation of Thursday the 5th because um, our goal on that day, obviously we didn't quite make it, was to get through all the departments and have an opportunity to have a really deep dive. So this is our chance to go not line by line, but department by department, phase by phase, and ask the questions that are going to allow the board to then go out and feel confident, comfortable advocating for this budget. Um, not all questions are answered immediately at this table, but this workshop gives us protected time to tackle on a little bit deeper level what's in the budget, what's not in the budget, and to hear directly from the folks who are managing those different phases and departments. This is our overview telling us what we did before, and uh, actually, the next couple of slides, I think, are, are kind of going to be a little bit of a repeat. 
but we wanted to reorient everyone to the work that we did on April, 4, uh, April 5th and um, to remind us all of what the process was about and uh, then to sort of feel as though we were up to speed and ready to jump start into the next segment of the same process. And I, I think that um, after participating in four out of the five budget outreach meetings, the, the work that we've done, or at least it seemed as though the work that we've done had really prepared all of the board members who spoke. You all were really articulate and able to answer the questions that were asked of you. Um, and we didn't really know what the questions would be. And they were wide and varied and different at each session. Um, and we hope that today will further deepen your understanding. You can also ask some clarifying questions if there's things since you since our last session or since the budget outreach meetings that um, you've been wondering about or that you've been asked. Kate and I are working collaboratively on answering all of those questions. Um, but later on, we're going to try to narrow it down to like what are the top five questions that we heard. So you can be thinking about that um, and thinking about how we can communicate this with our community. So we'll do a recap of our work. We'll talk about what new information that we have. We'll finish the sharing of the um, departments tonight. And then um, we'll develop those, you know, we'll continue to refine those talking points that we developed at our last session as well. So ready for the quick recap. Actually, any one of you could do this part, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll buzz through it. Uh, remember that this year our budget goals were to hold the operating budget under a 3% increase in expenditures. Check. We've been able to do that. We also wanted to hold the net <coughs> expenditure increase under 6% and we've been able to do that. Um, we also set a goal to pri prioritize our K-12 resources um, while also monitoring enrollment trends and, and trying to shift our existing resources to align with our shifting needs. Um, in the school system, our needs change daily, weekly, monthly, um, dependent upon what our students need and what our staff needs at the time. And we're always trying to create a budget that allows us to be flexible, agile, and responsive to those shifting needs. And we wanted to continue to do that here in FY19. Um, we also you know, have a um, moral and ethical and legal obligation to ensure that all students are receiving required and appropriate services. So. As we talk about often with our community, the public school system is unique um, in terms of uh, comparison to private schools because we educate every single student who shows up at our door and we educate them um, in a way that allows them to have a free and appropriate education. And that means that all students, no matter what their needs um, are, we have to ensure that they have full and equal access to our curriculum, to our activities, um, and to our programs. And so that's always a priority for us. And then, of course, we want to maintain the growth, the incremental growth that you have all worked so hard to achieve over time um, by maintaining our existing programs. And knowing that this was a tight budget year, we felt that we needed to articulate these goals really clearly so that we could keep this in mind as we're challenged with um, tough questions over the next few days. The other thing we're really preparing for, we have two big events coming up next week. We have May 1st, which is our Joint Town Council School Board Finance Committee meeting. Um, next door, there's some other um, departments having their opportunity with the Town Council to talk with, their, with them about their budgets. Jen, did you already go, Jen? Yeah. Jen had her turn today. I believe SEDCO and the library also um, had their turn today. So our turn is on May 1st. Um, we get to have protective time. Um, Six, six, I think it's six, but I'll double-check that yeah. while you talk. And is that, really. that's for the entire board, correct? It's, um, or it's a, it, we're doing it as a joint town council school board finance committee meeting this year, which is a little different than what we usually do, but I would encourage the full yeah, board to great. attend as long as you're able. There you go, it's right on your agenda at 6 o'clock. And then May 2nd, the very next night, is the, is the public hearing on the budget. Um, this is where we will learn if there are any refinements that need to be made. We might get some indication of that on May 1st from the council. Um, I don't know if Jen got any indication of that today. Okay, so we might get some indication of that on May 1st, and then we have um, second reading with, uh, yeah, public hearing on the 2nd, and then we have second reading on the 16th with the council, and then second reading with the school board on the 17th. So a busy couple of weeks coming up, and that's all listed on our agenda as well. Just so, we've just so you know, right up front, I am away from May 11th to, until May 19th. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, 
Jackie. Kate, were you going to add something? I was going to throw something in. I, I uh, kind of wrangled the school board finance committee into committing to a quick finance committee meeting just before the public hearing on May 2nd. And um, I believe Kelly posted that agenda out already um, for us. We just pulled that together on the fly because we really wanted a, a moment between the uh, Joint Finance Committee meeting and then the following uh, week when the, the Finance Committee of the Town Council will begin to talk about what their recommendations are uh, so that the, we can figure out what the will of the board is and, and act on our side. Um, and. The timing has shifted a little bit because the school board meeting, which would typically have been on the 3rd of May, is now going to be on the 10th of May. So we've been we've been juggling and adding and making people do extra things, and uh, I appreciate that. What time is the finance meeting on May 2nd? Finance meeting on May 2nd will be at 6.15. Okay. And uh, just before the public hearing. And at the moment, I believe uh, we've got it scheduled to be upstairs in the superintendent's conference room because these rooms are both going to be in use right before the, uh, the town council meeting. So every year as we develop the budget, we also have some challenges that we're aware of. Um, this is year two of us being in the receiver status. We also um, knew that last year in planning FY18 that we would have a fund balance gap to fill. Um, that was a $2.1 million fund balance. We've been working hard over the year with a curtailment and other cost-saving measures to minimize that gap um, as we prepared FY19. We continue to have rising fixed costs year after year in terms of salaries and benefits and then other utilities like fuels and our fuel and electricity. Um, and then we are always keeping an eye on the state and federal mandates and what's coming down the pike and how that will direct our work. Um, and just today we were engaging in some ESSA work, which is the federal mandate um, that replaces No Child Left Behind. So quick quiz, what does ESSA stand for? Every student succeeds at. Okay, good. <laughs> what do we what mean? does PBE stand for? And CDS? And CNA. And so what is CNA, Joanne? Joanne. CNA. Joanne learned a new one today. He's a suspect. <laughs> yes, yeah. not a nurse. All this time she Pretty thought nervous. it was the certified she nurse. She thought it was for a little while. Yeah. She thought it was, and then she came to the meeting and realized it was all about data. Yeah. <laughs> Too many acronyms in our business. So here's the big overview of our um, current proposed budget. And if you take a look here, this is that under 3% um, increase in expenditures we talked about. Uh, here's where we look at the tax request under 6% at 5.89%. Um, I'm just going to kind of zip through. If you have questions, just stop me. Um, we talked about the budget development decisions. This has also been part of our one pager. Again, remember our goal this year was to simplify language, make it more readable and digestible, more jargon free, um, while also trying to take a positive light on where we are, even in the midst of a challenging budget year. Um, so here's our investments for the year and the reductions that we've made. We also have highlighted what this budget allows us to do. We wanted to give people a reason to come out and vote for the budget, um, kind of switching the narrative instead of feeling up, instead of focusing on what we're taking away from the budget. We developed a bare, bone budget, bare bones budget from the gate, um, going as minimum as we could, um, and still feel like we were, um, you know, being professional, professionally responsible, and providing the type of program that our students need but also wanting people to say like, oh, that's something I've been looking forward to. Um, and then we've made the list of what's not in this budget. This is how we're categorizing these as unmet needs and the hopes that people would be saying, oh, I want that thing in the budget. I've really been wanting to have someone at the transportation office when I call in the afternoons. Um, let's add that back in. I don't know that this will be the year for that, but that's the shift that we're trying to make. Um, is coming out as, you know, as bare bones with our essential budget and then talking about what could we add to it or what do we need to take away as we understand the, the fiscal reality in town. So and there's I think, Julie, it also allows us to prep people's minds for the coming years because mm -hmm. typically from year to year when the Leadership Council gets together and talks about budget, a lot of the same things come up again and again. Sometimes need shift, sometimes you know a priority shift, but in, in a lot of cases the need that we didn't fill this year is going to be the same need that comes up 
to us next year. So it's sort of a heads up. And these are both really good examples. Um, you know, the, the transportation position has been a need for a number of years, and the career pathways, uh, intern specialist, the title's a little different than it was last year, but it's the same, it's to the same end. It's meeting those career and education development standards that are required by the state of Maine. Can I make a, just a comment, Julie? Sure. That, to me, that development director, I just feel like that could be a revenue neutral position. On the next slide? Yeah, on the next okay. slide. I just, I personally just feel really strongly that that you know, yes, it's money that we'd have to spend, but I just feel like I think we'd be able to get the grants to cover the position. That's a typical way that development positions are filled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or to do it, I just wonder, could you do it as a stipend position? Because that would reduce, then you wouldn't have to do benefits, and, you know, I, I just wondered if that was a... Yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, we could talk with Mike Legage more about that. I think, um, and Mike, feel free to jump in if I'm if I'm misrepresenting. But Mike's proposal, this is something he's been proposing for a number of years. And as we all know, our booster groups, we have over 32, I think 32 last time I counted, booster groups generate anywhere from three to $500,000 a year. And supplemental funds, as Jody Shea noted earlier, that supplement our programming in ways of um, assistant coaches or essential uh, equipment. Um, the football boosters, as you know, Leanne, fund you know equipment replacement, um, safety you know safety equipment, um, uniforms, uh, all kinds of things that are we wouldn't be able to run the programs without our boosters. And managing all of those funds is a big job. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's not a small amount of money that we're talking about. And so we made some efforts over the, or made some gains um, with Mike Legage's effort and Joanne and Kate to. Um, you know, refine the booster process and the, the bookkeeping of the booster group process, but there's more work that could be done, and really we think about this as how is this taxing our community? We have so many great businesses in our community that support this group and that 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 group, and here comes another group, and um, we, would, we think that we could, you know, gain some efficiencies in terms of generating funds with a position like this as well. And you know, also seeking grants it wasn't necessarily what this position was fully designed for. But I think we're always trying to find creative funding sources. So having somebody who's thinking about this all the time would be really beneficial to our. And I just wonder if it could be shared with the town because I think the, on the town side there's also grants, you know, available. Mm -hmm. so, but I just I just think that's that could really help. <laughs> yeah. In my mind. But yeah. Yeah. I agree. Two cents. And I just wanted to ask about the uh, additional support for 504s and behavior. Um, there's no amount there. Are you thinking of an ed tech here? I mean, that particular one strikes a note with me because it's really significant to not have that extra help for those kinds of issues right there. Mm -hmm. And so, do you have a, a dollar amount on that? And what are we going to do for those situations? that are sitting in those classrooms every day without that, how are we gonna cover that? How does that end up getting covered? So we're thinking really hard about that too and we didn't price it out here just knowing that it wasn't going to be something that we could ask for this year but we wanted to put the ask on the table so people are starting to think about it. And it, it to, could it be an ad tech? The answer to that is simply no. This has to be someone who either has an administrative license or is, a, is um, pursuing an administrative license so that they could oversee these types of things. And so the challenge that we have at Wentworth and at the middle school is that um, these, these schools are large schools. We have over 700, I think 715 or 17 kids at the middle school and close to 700 at Wentworth. And so they're, it's really too big of a student population for two administrators, but it's not really large enough to justify a third administrator like we have at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so right now, what happens at the middle school, um, well at the high school right now, Mike Legage, the athletic director, covers some 504s along with um, one of the other assistant principals, covers a lot of the 504s. Um, at the middle school, Jake Brown, who is a stipended middle school athletic director, um, he does a lot of the behavioral supports and or um, eligibility supports for students and so he's created a really great program that allows 
allows us or him really as a full-time teacher he also monitors athletes um, in their academic progress or their behavioral progress so that before they become ineligible he's providing intervention plans so that they can get back on track um, and become successful before they're in that consequential stage of being ineligible and he what we're not able to do it's a lot for him to do and he's managing that well um, I don't know how but he is and um, but we're not able to do provide the same supports for students who are in extracurricular clubs mm -hmm. um, and we would like to be able to because mm -hmm. we think that you know in the name of equity all students should have access to that so that support so um, we're gonna keep thinking about this and see is there a way we can start to do some of this work with existing resources but want to just keep an eye on the need, particularly as um, you know, behavioral needs are changing for students and there's more and more supports and individual plans and safety care plans and things like that are needing to be put in place. Mm -hmm. So we haven't quantified mm -hmm. an actual FTE or dollar amount for that this year. Mm -hmm. So to me, this is no small need. Mm -hmm. this, this is very significant and I think our community needs to be aware of it whenever we have the opportunity to be out there in the public talking about what this is mm -hmm. because those 504 is okay so that that's something that kids who fall outside of special ed but who still have some need some kind of need to make their education possible equal to an, a regular ed kid so it, it, it's not a special ed student but there is something going on there it's a civil rights act Yes, I mean, it could be an emotional issue, it could be a temporary issue, mm -hmm. it could be a medical kind of a thing that, that needs some kind of change in the school day for that kid. And so when you look at those extracurricular activities, so what I hear the superintendent saying is that, yeah, maybe we're providing that in the regular ed classroom for the regular subject areas, it's not being provided when that child goes to music or PE or somewhere else in the building to the library, the support is not going to be there. Or they're trying to band-aid patch by using people who already have a full-time job. What what to actually try happens? To cover those. Not to interrupt you, but what actually happens is that means that it's the principal and the assistant principal who are picking that up. We're never not providing the service that a student mm -hmm. needs, um, but it means that the principals and the assistant principals aren't providing the support to teachers in the classroom in terms of you know feedback on evaluations, and they're spending a lot of their time behind closed doors, you know, managing the individual student needs, whether it be behavioral supports or 504s or IEPs and things like that. And that's just really the nature of the job of a, of a school principal. It doesn't really look like it did um, 10 years ago or, you know, even five years ago um, with all that they're balancing right now. Mm -hmm. So we're watching that closely and monitoring enrollment and, um, as we get into more of a, a data mindset, looking at how can we really quantify that need um, mm -hmm. by tracking some data and looking at how many hours are spent at, at mm -hmm. how many how much how many administrative hours does it take to support one student with a 504 between meetings and planning and things like that? How much time is spent supporting students to ensure that they're eligible for extracurriculars? Mm -hmm. So we look forward to coming back with more data about these things. Donna, did you leave? I can tell you from personal experience that specialists, such as the physical education, art, music teachers, often have a different perspective on a student. I've known students who really didn't like physical education at all, but excelled in art or excelled in music. I'm talking about youngsters now. Both, and then at the high school, it's the same thing. You get a different perspective on a student. And if you work with the principal and you work with the classroom teacher, and, and you, and the classroom teacher can point out to a student that they can learn math through their art or their music or their physical education. And we worked very hard at that when I was up 
on Mundroy Hill, which at the time was a poverty school. And, and the teachers work collaboratively. I think that probably is going on in Scarborough, but it's never been emphasized. And, and specialists have, a, as I say, see children in a different light and see some positive skills that are not apparent in the classroom. And, and if we can emphasize that, in our schools and work together to improve a child's learning through the special programs that we offer. It gives us a leg up. It also gives us another teacher who make, can make a positive impact on the child's life. Okay, so this slide may look familiar to you because we saw this one on April 5th and the point of having this in the presentation on April 5th was that during the first reading of the budget there are lots of items that are um, impactful to the bottom line but that we don't really have necessarily complete information on yet. Um, that's true just because of the timeline of the budget development process we have to have a first reading before we have all the answers. Um, so this slide is what you saw on April 5th. We identified a number of areas where we knew that we had items in motion and where we would be getting more information as we went through the budget process. Um, Julie, if you want to click us to the next slide. This slide is a little bit sad <laughs> because um, if you remember from what you just saw, we budgeted projected Anthem rates at a 5% increase, which was the average of the past four years, and a good guess. Um, it wasn't a great guess, however, because we now have Anthem rates. They came in a couple weeks ago, and they are in at 7.2% increase, which means that the budget overall, the cost of benefits for all the employees in the Scarborough School Department needs to be increased by $110,000. Um, Delta Dental, same problem. We budgeted at a plus 1% and we came in at a plus 3.2%. Um, sorry, is that, so is that an increase of 110,000 from what you projected at 5% or from no. last year? From what I projected at 5%. More than last year. It's an add to, oh, and here, let me pass these around as I'm talking because um, I don't know if you remember last year we had these sort of process worksheets that people seem to find helpful. Um, so I've started one of those for the budget process for this year. At the top of this page you'll see um, the budget as it was presented at first reading. In the middle of the page you'll see stuff that's happened, pluses and minuses. And then at the bottom you'll see what that does to the bottom line. I want to make, uh, make it clear that this doesn't mean that this is our new budget, that this is what the board has agreed to or anybody's agreed to. All this represents is things that we've learned since we had the first reading and changes that we need to take into account before the second reading and figure out what we need to do about those. So to continue going through, we do have some reductions. Um, they're not as great as Anthem. Anthem is one of our biggest costs. But we were able to reduce our projection for workers' comp premiums uh, by about $34,000. Um, we also found, I didn't find it, but some of our, uh, my colleagues and, and some of our citizens found a really ugly mistake in one of my calculations. There were five benefit lines uh, that pulled an extra column in and double counted something. So um, that, I, I was actually delighted to find out that there was a $32,000 mistake. Um, and uh, obviously I needed a proofreader, but I'm grateful for the mistake. We would have caught it on the second round, but we'll take it now. We're happy to take it. Uh, change in retirement projections is just a little amount. And what that means is that folks have um, they've advised us that they intend to retire, and for most of those people who have been with the district long enough, there's a retirement payout, which is um, in the teacher's contract, it's also in the support staff contract, and it has a dollar value. It's equivalent to 30 days of unused sick time at their per diem rate. So um, 
at January 1st, folks are supposed to tell us whether they have an intent to retire at the end of the year. If they do so, then we'll budget for that retirement stipend based on their actual uh, pay rate. So when you see change in retirement projections, what that means is that we had a couple of people who weren't sure, and we went ahead and we put the money in the budget, and then they said, well, actually, we're not, we've changed our mind, we're not going. Um, the reason that it's not thousands and thousands of dollars is that we also take um, a guess at what the reduction in a salary is going to be for a person at the top of the scale who's leaving. So in the original projection, we're taking a person who's going to retire and we're assuming that we're going to hire someone cheaper because most of the time we don't go out and get someone at the very top of the salary scale when someone retires. Um, so that's a long way around of saying that we've come up with a little bit of a change based on actual human beings and their plans for the coming year. The total change, and you can see it on the sheet, which I went and handed them all out, so no, I don't have them. Um, you'll see on the, on the middle of the sheet that there's uh, one bar of green, that's the change to the general fund, and then with Anthem, Delta, and Work Comp, we're also making little changes to both the Delta Ed and School Nutrition because those have people in them too. So I broke that out for you. And then at the bottom of the page and on the next slide, it's going to tell you what that does to our bottom line. And again, um, we're not saying that this is our new budget or that this is what's going to be voted on come May 16 or 17. This is what these changes do um, without any other consideration to the bottom line. And if, if the state doesn't, if the legislature does not reconvene? We won't have any subsidy either, right? Well, we won't have an increase in subsidy. I'm sort of concerned that we won't get anything because they haven't appropriated the funds. Hmm. They would appropriate, they'll have to appropriate something because it's the law, but. Mm. Doesn't it just fall back to whatever the appropriation was from last year? I don't know what the legal ramification of that is. I think that even though there's a two year budget, they have to pass an appropriation bill that funds it for the second year. So I'm not okay, sure right. what it means, whether they fund it at this level or this level, um, you know, where, where it falls if they don't do that. I, I believe they have every intent of doing it. I don't know if they'll be successful though, Jack, either. They're no, I don't know. Uh, there is speculation that, that they will be called back next Wednesday, but that hasn't happened yet. And it's my understanding that it's the increase that had been proposed that has not been voted on. That if if they don't reconvene, that then they would keep it up. The then it level. would be at the level that we received this year. <clears throat> that so. would be a tough one to vote. I read the letter. It almost seemed like it was saying that it wouldn't happen July first either. Like that, or maybe just that amount wouldn't be coming July first. I, I don't. You know, I asked Steve about it last night, and he said there hour by hour at the moment. Mm. I did send an email to my state. Pardon me? I sent an email to my state rep asking, you know, hoping that they would give us a, a little heads up about what's going on. Before we leave that page, um, it came up at one of the sessions, and I don't remember which one it was at, that this came up. But about that adult ed budget, you can speak to it now yeah. or later, but uh, that was a specific question, and I think it would help to hear from any one of you. Um, a little bit more about the adult ed budget because it, there's a misunderstanding in the community about what the heck that is all about because I think there's a idea of something that was adult ed 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And so the can, can Joanne or somebody? Well, that is that's one of our departments. Oh, you got one of our departments. Can we wait until we get to that? Sure, yeah, you can. I just didn't want to get it. It is yep. one of our departments coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. Joanne's going to tell us all why we need that. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, and again, I, I've said this three times, so you can kick me, but this is not the final budget. This is what we have to work with, what's been in, put in our laps now. And so there's going to be some decisions to be made, and those decisions will be made between our finance committee, 
our full board and the town council finance committee and their board. Good. That's why all those upcoming meetings are going to be really important. Can I ask another question? As far as like the negotiations that are still in motion, so in your budget, do you kind of pad it with a little bit, kind of knowing there's going to be some kind of increase? Or, or we do. It, or it, okay, I, I just didn't know. Yeah, um, typically with negotiations um, that are open, uh, the way that we typically budget is to uh, assume that the expiring salary table or wage table or whatever it is will continue and that the existing staff will move up a step if that's what it would happen on the existing table. We don't assume because we can't really guess about any drastic changes in the way the, ta the tables are built. Um, and then we add, um, depending on what we're hearing from the negotiating committee and from the SEA will add a little bit of a COLA in there so that we have room for good faith bargaining and uh, for an opportunity to let you folks have your conversations. Um, now, that said, if you have gone into negotiations and you have, for example, a, a, you know, you've already got some agreements, you've got some kinds of uh, decisions that have been made, right, tentative agreement TAs or um, then we can always refine our projections. We can say, well, actually, we know now that it's going to be this, and then we can go back and change that. It's nice if that timing happens before we pass the budget. It doesn't usually work that way, but it has been in the past. Good question. Other thoughts? The next slide is the questions and wonderings. Is that what, are we, is that where we're Are we doing questions and wonderings? Yeah. So, I saw oh my god, we've been doing them without the note paper. <laughs> so I know they were I've using the paper and waiting patiently like I said. I just didn't click the slide. So I just had a question about the anthem rate. And I think it said this year it went up seven point two percent. Wasn't it what was it last year? Just to demonstrate how it varies. So oh, I'm crazy. sorry, the, the anthem rates? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't it was like, a pleasant surprise. Yeah, it was like one point. Last year was, yeah, was Hello, tiny. I'll get the, the numbers for you while we go through here. Less than two. Yeah. Less and so it just shows you that it's, you know, we, so we take five years as an average, yeah. and that comes up to 5%, but literally last year, 12 months ago, it was 1.2, and now this year it's, or whatever it is, 1 point whatever, and this year it's 7.2. So it's so mm -hmm. hard to gauge. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really up and down, and, and you know, uh, having listened to me whine about this before, that uh, I really prefer as a conservative budgeter to budget high and then and, and then cheer mightily when it goes down. Um, and this year we tried a different strategy and we tried to be, you know, as, as lean as we possibly could going in. And this is unfortunately, you know, the, the risk that we took. Um, let me see if I have it right here. I mean, you can get back to me. I just, that was just... Your no, it's a good but question. to that point, that's why when we talk about the first reading, it's such a, a challenging conversation, and it really is just to get us started to have the conversation, mm -hmm. because if we were to come... And it's hard, too, because sometimes those first numbers stick in people's minds, right? Mm -hmm. And so this year, we really wanted to come in with lo the lowest numbers we could, so we budgeted a little bit differently, um, not as conservatively as Kate would want to, so we could get below that three and six, and then now you're, we're seeing. <coughs> right, but I mean, I, I, you know, you don't know. It's right. a 5% guess seems, yeah. I, I was sort of optimistic, knowing last year it was less than two, so you just don't know. So I feel like a five-year look back seems reasonable. Seems rational, right? Yeah, and unfortunately, um, the you can see the curve. I just pulled it up here from 2013 to 2014, it was 8%. From 14 to 15, it was 5%. From 15 to 16, it was 0.9%. 16 to 17, an, an adjustment, 8.81%. That's the highest. And last year was 1.21. So, you know, you're, you can talk about averages, but the way that Anthem actually produces their rates doesn't flow that way. It's really all based on their loss experience. And that fluctuates because we're all human beings and we all get sick and, and cost things at different rates. Apparently all in the same year. Apparently all at once. <laughs> yeah. And does, Kate, does that make you say, oh, we need to look into other insurance plans? Like, is there, a, is there a percentage increase at a point where you say, okay, maybe we need to check about other ones? I, I didn't know we what would, that process We would love was. to, and that's something that I could um, give you a little seminar about. But, uh, <laughs> 
we can't escape Anthem because of their relationship with the NEA Benefits Trust and because all of our retirees are linked into the plan. And so our demographic is just not very attractive to any other insurers. Um, so there have been opportunities and, and, and willingness to go out into the market and look for other insurance, but it's just been, um, it's not, we're not attractive to other insurers. I think it was like five years ago we did a health insurance study. Mm -hmm. um, what, five, would that, what? Five, 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 five or six years, years ago? ago. We did a health uh, insurance study and um, they didn't want to really look at us yeah. after they saw it numbers and so forth. But do other insurance companies not have those crazy dips and I don't really know whether there would be like we might less have, volatility. We, we might be jumping into the same issue yeah. that we have now. Yeah. Right. I don't know if there would be less volatility. I think that you're right um, in that you know the whole insurance market is kind of wacky. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be nice to be able to shop around from year to year but um, with the way that it's structured um, with the, the um, MEA. MEA retirees being linked to the individual um, school units, uh, it's we're really just not that interesting to insurance companies. Our demographic, our demographic shifts very. Um, I was going to say, ten years ago, maybe we negotiated with the, with our uh, administrative group, to have the health insurance from Maine Municipal Association. And it was less expensive. But we found, number one, they under that plan at that time, they had to pay everything up front and then get reimbursed. It didn't cover mammograms. And there were other items like that that were not covered under that plan. And even though we had a three-year contract, uh, we reopened the contract and, and took our administrators back to Anthem because it was just costing them so much money and it wasn't covering everything that needed to be covered. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Anyone else wondering about anything? Anyone noticing anything? Oh, yeah, noticing. <laughs> We have two minutes. Oh, right. Ooh, you have two yeah. minutes. Okay, well, we're good. <laughs> yeah, but we went over by yeah. more than two minutes. Okay. So Joanne's going to yeah. use them. She needs, right. she needs the tour. All right, so um, health services. Um, you know, health services uh, 10 years ago was extremely different than it is today. Our, our, health, our school nurses are working with medical needs and emotional needs of our students. But some of the things that we feel really good about is that um, over the last three years, we have increased our flu clinics in the school, and um, more and more kids are participating and staff. Um, we do um, a lot of training for our staff and first responders. For first responders, we're looking at all the office staff in our schools, the bus drivers, um, and that training for CPR is done with them. And, and the, that's done every year? Every fall, year. Right, John? every year before school starts, we have uh, that training. Um, one of the big things is that, you know, um, we wanted to go digital for many years, I would say for the last six years, and we finally did last year, starting the process, have a health office anywhere system, and it has made, I think, a big difference in um, getting information to parents, uh, notifying them. Um, all of our records are now kept I shouldn't say all. Many of the records are now kept as we've done the transition and the entering of the information. Um, and uh, the nurses are, have worked really hard to learn this new management system. So what are our challenges? Well, if you look on page 35 of your book, uh, school nursing is extremely different. The number of concussions, the medical needs that kids have. A student comes in with a concussion the nurse is doing a uh, plan and then working with the teachers and what that plan is and what does the, um, what does the student need and following up and, and, and so forth. Students who have di diabetes are in the clinic being managed by them. And then just the, all the other help, um, health care that kids need today um, and medical issues that they might have. You know, a student breaks their ankle, the support that they need, from the nurse, the nurse corresponding with the parent, 
So it really has become a very different um, job than what it was 10 years ago for them. Uh, sometimes they'll say, you know, a, a new student is coming in with this, and I'm like, what the heck is that? And they're trying to explain it to me. But it's, um, there's a lot of needs out there, and um, I, they think they do a really good job because we do not have a nurse in all of our schools. They have to cover for each other, and so we have schedules. Where are the kids that need those services every single day? Some have to travel here and there and split that, so it does get complicated for them. But they also play a really critical role in our policy development. Yes, they were very good this year. We have Narcan. They've all been trained again with Narcan. That's going to be coming into the school. Um, they worked with the different policies on medical marijuana with you. Mm -hmm. And so um, they are, and they do a lot with our health and wellness for students and staff uh, on the wellness committee. I know some mm -hmm. of them work with Kate for a district-wide uh, wellness mm -hmm. uh, committee. Yeah, and on our pre-K committee, too. Yes. Um, pre-K health and safety advisory team. Yeah, yeah. It, it's remarkable. I mean, it, you, you say you hired a school nurse, and, and we're all thinking, you know, Band-Aids and aspirin, and mm -hmm. the level of medical interventions that they do daily with kids, and then they also find time to help out with staff and with some of these organizational pieces. They're just mm -hmm. remarkable people. And I have to say, you know, students who are in need, you know, they'll reach out to Project Grace, they'll have clothing, you know, they really They're go definitely. that extra, um, what are your needs, not just medical, you know, but some of the physical needs, so, you know, student needs clothing or so forth like that, they're right there with that. The, um, oh, another right. student? Am I allowed to say it yet? No, you don't have to. And then we get to the wondering. Sorry. Sorry. Another sheet. <laughs> okay, so we're going to adult ed. What is adult ed today? Um, we, our program at um, Scarborough High School, I would say nine years ago, we did a lot of uh, credit recovery for high school students. What page is that you in? Um, it's up there. 67. 57? 67. 67. Thank you. Um, Ten years ago, they did a, adult ed did a lot of um, credit recovery. Students who were failing, coming in, taking that class so they could graduate on time, uh, doing a lot of GEE t um, uh, work so that students who decided they didn't want to finish high school could come back um, and take their GE. And um, over the last, I'd say, five or six years, we really have looked at workforce development. And the workforce development has been with um, CNAs, the Certified Nurse <laughs> Assistants, <laughs> that I'm familiar with. But our director has worked with numerous um, nursing facilities in the area, Piper Shores, Maine Veterans Home, Genesis. She's gone into Portland. And we have offered some, uh, uh, Pine Point Nursing, Scarborough Terrace, um, we've offered these CNA programs and many of them um, have gotten jobs there. I think last year we had a rate of about 47 who became CNAs in one year and um, so that's 47 people who were able to <coughs> obtain jobs. Um, another one that we started was a certified residential medication aid. This is a new, um, it was a program that uh, also to give out medication. It was big with Piper Shores because they're adding a whole new facility and we're looking for people to do the medication. Um, they have medical billing, pharmacy tech, a phlebotomy technician. Um, those programs are also offered through our adult ed program. English lang language learners, um, we had a few people and we were looking how can we increase that and um, Joan Trembreth, who is the director, started working with Portland Public Schools in the Port Portland Adult Ed Program, and they had an overflow and they weren't able. And so she has many of them from Portland coming for day and evening classes that she is offering. And um, so that has helped uh, tremendously. And then college and career counseling is offered to adults who <coughs> decide they want to go, um, go back to college. They haven't started college. They need to take an AccuPlacer to get to um, Southern Maine community, so they come in and she will help them prepare for the active place and give the online testing so when they get over there, they've already done some of the pre-work. And then the credit recovery for students and adult high school diplomas, that new program, it's not called the GED anymore, it's called HiSET, and we have people who work individually with people who want to get uh, their high school diploma. 
And then we have an enrichment um, portion of adult ed that is just, you want to learn how to play a guitar, you want to learn something about gardening, we've done some things on environmental, and they offer over 100 different classes um, through the enrichment program. On May 2nd, there's a civil discourse class by the American League of Women Voters. We'll be at the budget hearing, but I know there's some people in town who are passionate about that initiative, so that's offered there too. And it's like five dollars or ten dollars. Okay. Can we yeah. do the next one? Transportation. This one we've had a lot of discussions this year through transportation, but again, to just keep in mind how big Scarborough is and how many miles a year our buses are doing. Um, I always love, I keep on using the same thing because I hope it will stick. It's like traveling around the world, approximately 25,000 miles. Therefore, you could travel around the world 18 times annually. That's how big Scarborough is, okay? Um, we provide training to new, to new drivers who are successful in attaining this CDL. We have trained, um, I'd have to say maybe five people now. There is a new pr um, protocol with the state in that they have to do so many hours of classroom sitting before they can get their CDL license. And so we have now uh, started that program with uh, drivers and Sarah and um, our trainer um, are working with people. We've had them come in. Sometimes, you know, getting a CDL license is not, I have to say, it's probably not the easiest thing to do. And um, people, I think, sometimes are shocked at the difficulty of the questions. And so working with them in um, learning the language for the CDL language also has helped them. Um, our bus drivers have been engaged in very caring projects for students. They're looking out for them. If they notice that a student um, is, uh, you know, not smiling, doesn't seem happy, they might just go in and tell Sarah and she might make a little quick phone call to the school and just say, you know, the bus driver noticed something today, maybe someone should talk to them. I know that one of our bus drivers, um, I was, uh, one of our, we've done the suicide awareness training with everybody, and uh, last year one of our bus drivers um, had a concern about a student and um, immediately let us know and we were able to get the student some help. And so having everyone trained in those kind of, and being aware was very helpful. Our challenges finding and hiring qualified drivers is always going to be a challenge, but um, I think we have five people new since January, and um, you know I'm interviewing another person uh, next week, so we're really getting we're on a little bit of a streak right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're we just been yeah. back on some wood. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't jinx it. <laughs> no, no. Um, our unmet needs. Um, you know, the point seven five for the support for the transportation department, just have another person down there if someone had to drive, so it's not, so you can answer the phone and be responsive. The GPS installation, that's a lot of money. And you know, when we're ready to make that kind of commitment of over 150000 you know, then I think we should look at that. But right now it's a lot of money. Um, we are able to put cameras in our buses. We have probably four to eight cameras in every bus, and that's through a grant. Um, and so that has been helpful. Nice job, Jeremy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quick. Mm -hmm. Right now, noticing some questions. Now, questions. <clears throat> I have some questions about adult ed. Mm -hmm. um, does adult ed pay for itself? What's the revenue? Adult has, Ed has a just under $100,000 contribution from the town. Um, and the, it's about $188,000 budget. And that's been pretty steady for as long as I've been building budgets. Um, there was a $90,000 contribution back when I first started doing this. So we haven't increased it, but we haven't eliminated it either. Okay. Um, and I think that you know the original investment on the part of the school department in the town is just an understanding the value of that program to the community. So it's not really So any natural. increases have come from us offering more because the state gives us the rest of the money. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I'm, Joanne? I'm glad you asked that question because that's exactly what came up at that meeting from people is to why, why do we pay? Why do we pay anything for that? Well, we have. 
In other words, the thinking is, is that where you got it from too? Did you, did you have that question at any of the forums you went to? Mm. Well, yeah, I have one, of, and this is my second question. I had a similar question, which was, why do we offer the same adult education services as Saco and um, you know all our surrounding towns when my understanding is that you can go to any one of them. So that was like, it's more are there community based. Um, some programs don't have the CNA program and so what they are trying to do is put them into clusters such as a regional service uh, center mm -hmm. idea. So they might, they're working on five different adult ed programs that are gonna be in a cluster. And from that cluster, they're going to look at what kind of programs they're offering. But a lot of times people, like, well, that's my point. people can't, don't have a car. Right. So in order for them to get to the high school, they might be able to do that in the town where they are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what we found. Some of the CNAs are from Scarborough. You know, I think it'll, um, be, it'll be interesting to see how adult ed morphs over time yeah. because it yeah. really has gone, as Joanne said earlier, it's gone from a program that really was, you know, fun, cool enrichment things and then um, supports for our high school kids, which is why it's based in the high school, which is why right. it has been traditionally founded as a, as a school program. And it's changed now into much more of a community-based program and much more of an adult opportunity for, you know, employment and, right. you know, and for bettering themselves as, as uh, citizens. And, uh, and so. also the link to a community college system, which Maine was really lacking 10 years ago on a community college system. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, a lot of people That's are really doing the community college uh, route and the adult debt programs is becoming a link to get there. Mm -hmm. Getting through the... Um, what do we call this? The the prerequisites. Yeah, for prerequisites. The active placer that they all have to take before they get into the community mm -hmm. college. If you have any language deficiencies, that you take an ELL class and then you can be placed in a community college. So I mean, it's a fair question. Why is that K, a K twelve education obligation? Um, it's not really, but traditionally it has been, and it's grown out of our systems. And so you know, it's it's really open to interpretation what value that adds in the community. What is the requirement from the state for us to have adult mm -hmm. education? We're not required to have it. They provide subsidy for the academic programming that we provide right. and also and for the career. workforce programming. And how many people do we employ in this? One, one and a half. half. So is it the, the one is the part-time position? Is part-time the director. director. Half-time? Half-time half -time director. And is it half it's time? really, um, point seven seven we don't really have an FTE for her, but I think she'd probably equate to about half time and then a point eight uh, administrative assistant. assistant. And then point the people eight. who do the CNA, so for instance, some of the uh, nursing facilities will say, I'll give you the instructor if you um, get if you the students. If you put the program together and get the students and take mm -hmm. the money and, yeah. Or so. they will say, um, if they have people who are working at their facility, who want to become CNAs, they will pay for the CNA because it's some, the about a thousand dollars to become a CNA. So they might pay for that. Okay. Okay. And so employ the person right yeah. away. Right. Do so we have a continuing um, relationship with Comfort Keepers still? Yes. Yeah. Yep, Is that's, that going yep. well? That's going well. Mm -hmm. There's a number of the of com Comfort Keepers as one, but then some of the nursing homes as well that we mm -hmm. have collaborations with. I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fabulous program. I don't know if it's really, really strictly our purview. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's a topic for debate. But yeah. this is how it's grown, and, you know, we're, we've been committed to keeping it successful, and whether the town wants to continue to invest in it. And is it's, an uh, I have to say, every time we have a graduation for the CNAs or mm -hmm. for someone who has gone back to school to get their um, high school degree, um, for me, knowing a lot of kids who have come through the school system, and uh, there's been many of them who have come back, done the CNA program, or someone who, you know, didn't finish high school but decided at 30 I better go get a high school diploma, and you know they'll show up with their family. It's it's really very rewarding to see that. It's yeah. still individualized pathways. It's just a little longer term. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, I've gone to those graduations over the past three or four years, 
and it's worth it for you to go to that little graduation. It's usually a little yep. ceremony in the high school in one, one room. Yep. We and try to make it, you know, they're getting a high school diploma, and mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that they have a cap and gown and do so, it. So all ages and yeah. all income levels, and so when you see that, and like Joanne said, if, you know, if there's a 45-year-old person there saying, I'm getting my high school diploma, yeah, it's very wanted. touching because when they show up, like I said, with their family, um, and their children sometimes, yeah, and their children who are so proud of them for, for at that age to go back and get a high school diploma. I have a question about the um, outside districts. Mm -hmm. If we're taking in their students, do we get any mm -hmm. revenue for that? Yep, okay. yep. That's exactly um, when she heard that Portland had an overflow and couldn't meet their needs. We took that on because then we will be using, we'll get credit for them through the state. So we do. Well, and yes. all of the programs are tuitioned, so it's not like uh, K-12 education. So if you want to take a class, it might be $5 or it might be $1,000, depending on what you're taking. Mm -hmm. But they are all tuitioned, so it, that's why there is a revenue source apart from town funding. Great. Yeah. I have some busing questions, transportation questions. Um, how are we anticipating that um, going from three-tier busing to two-tier busing is going to change our fuel needs or, uh, you know, anything along those lines, so. Well, we definitely know there's going to be route efficiencies, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know that we've calculated that out that. specifically yet, but we can do some baseline calculations and report back on that, like after the first semester or so, mm -hmm. so that um, we can monitor that and keep it a watchful eye. Well, can I just follow up on the bus? Are we going to do buses too? I was going to ask a question on buses, but go ahead. Oh, oh okay. Um, I just wanted, do we have the, you know, like the, the amount of bus drivers that we need now mm -hmm. then? Right now mm -hmm. we're, we're yep, full? Yep. Oh, wow. yeah. And Sarah's working on the updated um, first stop pickup, last stop drop off schedule. And she'll be able to also, I believe, report out the incremental. So, you know, the first pickup might be at 8 o'clock, the next one at 8.05 or 8.03. Um, she's been working on that this week. Yeah. So there's 19 drivers, mm -hmm. full, well, and we 20. have 19 right now. We have 19 now. We're up to 21. We have two more when that when that was published. Oh, and what did sorry? What did we? What's in the What's in the um, budget? Budget for next year. 22, I think. 22, 22, 22 yeah. Okay. And we like to have. 22 is our. 22 is like yeah. our sweet spot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions. Number one, how many of the buses actually have GPS? None. 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 Zero. None. Zero. Well, I thought that you had said at one time that when we bought new buses, for, we had been putting in the GPS. No, system. cameras. And the well, I knew the checks. cameras. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, none of the buses have GPS. No. no. How many of the buses are using alternative fuel? Uh, that's okay. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, I need Jane Mason to yell um, me at them. Well, well approximately I think half, a third. Oh, no, no, it's not that many. Um, it's probably, I don't know if it's four or six. And we, we brought propane buses um, with EPA grants. And we were, you know, trying to leverage funding and um, also be um, ecologically forward-thinking. Uh, the difficulty that's arisen, two things. One is that the, the Public Works folks have found that the propane buses are a little harder to work on. Um, they're a little less easy to um, maintain. Uh, but the big question for us has been that there are not propane fueling stations as widely spread as we would like them to be. So we're limited in where we can take those vehicles. Um, so if you need to you know, do a round trip to Bangor, you probably won't send a propane bus. And so that's been the biggest thing that's held us back from switching to alternative energy because that infrastructure isn't out there. Um, okay, are there limitations to the propane buses in the winter months as well? We had some issues in the beginning with them starting uh, because of the nature of the fuel, the liquid fuel, but um, they did overcome those. They, they figured out how to make that work. So they don't have that issue so much. It's, it's really the biggest deficit, I think, is just that Similar to electric cars, you know, there's there's just not that right. um, nationwide infrastructure that's been built yet to support having those alternative fuel vehicles out there um, in a, on a grand scale. And 
the maintenance aside, uh, are they more? I know they're more efficient. Is it less expensive? Um, right now, there's a fuel rebate from the feds for propane fuel. Uh, without the rebate, they are more expensive because the propane fuel uh, retail is actually higher cost than diesel. But it's, um, I but thought it's it was subsidized more, by the feds. I thought they're more fuel efficient. They yes. Less fuel. Um, I, I don't know if I could do a dollar for dollar comparison um, yeah, on the vehicles, but I think it's probably pretty much of a wash where the higher cost, the rebate, and the more fuel efficiency equals out to the diesel. But the point I'm trying to make, too, for the public is that we're doing everything possible to try and make, become an efficient running organization, mm -hmm. and it includes our buses. Yeah, and I, I agree with Julie that we'll be able to tell pretty early on, you know, in the fall with the two-tier bus system what kind of uh, mileage we're getting because we do get a lot of good data off the vehicles every month. We get reports about the fuel usage and we get reports about the mileage. And, um, it'll become pretty clear to us how that's trending, um, whether, you know, bus fuel costs themselves will stay stable is another question, but at least the efficiency will be there. Another thing that the public needs to be aware of as you are speaking is that uh, with, with the mechanic at the town garage and with oh. <laughs> the way that, that he keeps or the town maintenance staff keeps track of our costs and how Todd uh, keeps track of the cost of fuels and, and all of those things, all of the data that is collected on a weekly, monthly, annual basis so that we can budget efficiently is sometimes n not known. You know, it's, we have good people doing good jobs uh, trying to keep our costs as, as slim as possible. Well, and energy costs are notoriously volatile, oh. which the public knows because they pay them as well. 20 um, cents a gallon. It's gone up 20 cents a gallon this week from last week. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we do, to Jackie's point, is one of the things we do is we try to lock in on contracts with fuel so that we can have at least um, consistency in budgeting and uh, state-wise time. Do I okay. Do I um, the second thing is that Todd puts in energy efficient um, equipment whenever he can, and he'd want me to say that. So. What happens? If, well, what happens if there's no more rebate for that for the, for the propane. propane fuel? Right. That's why we haven't bought any more of them. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, no, actually, there's a number of reasons, I think, but I think we had nine at one time, so now we're down to four. Okay, school nutrition. As you know, the last three years, uh, we've had a shared service with Cape Elizabeth. It's worked out extremely well. Um, the staff has gone through intensive training. There's a whole different approach in the kitchens um, of cooking, using um, fresh produce. Uh, does a lot with buy local in, in the area. Um, we were just talking today about the summer a lunch program and how to increase some things with uh, summer lunch for kids through community service. Um, this year parents are going to be able to use the, um, I never know the name of the online system to pay instead of sending in money during the summer. They can just use their student's account which will make it a lot easier uh, for parents and for, you know, and for community service and the food service department. But we were talking about what we could offer for food in the summer. There's going to be a middle school program, um, and the middle school program, middle school kids love the sandwich bar, and so they're going to be doing something like that every day, having a a la carte and sandwich bar for middle school kids who are participating in the um, community service uh, summer program. So it's going to have an another look, new look to it, and some a la carte items for the middle school kids, and um, <coughs> the... Uh, middle school kids will come over to Wentworth and have lunch there um, and so forth. As you know, the community, the community Thanksgiving dinner has been a huge success. We've done that two years in a row, and Peter has really done an excellent job along with his staff in organizing it and preparing the food. 
Um, this year he did a Valentine's Day dance. Um, it, it was, they helped uh, do the food for that. The backpack program is their you know, program, weekly support, school vacations. They're even doing some students on a daily basis right now to help them out. Um, over 2,200 meals per day are produced and um, we're really proud of what they've done. Central office. We're looking at each other like, who's in central office? I don't know anybody who works there. All right, well, so one of the things that we've been working on since last year um, and into this year is trying to generate some more creative funding um, sources through community partnerships. So this year we started this um, Red Storm debit card with Saco Bitterberg Savings. We won't have the numbers um, for that yet until September, um, but all of that, remember, all of the, the um, monies generated from every swipe or however they're going to end up calculating. I think they're trying to see sort of how many touches there are this, you know, throughout this year before they generate, a, you know, cost per swipe or um, how they'll al al um, allocate that. But that all goes towards the nutrition program as well. And so um, and the other... The other thing that we did, we have a local realtor in town, a young um, entrepreneur, um, Matt Bullerice and his fiance Tori live in town and they, they recently moved back to town. Matt is a Scarborough grad and he also is a member of our community business partnership. They own the New England Realty Group um, and they have don uh, committed to donating. They made, I think, a $500 initial donation and then they committed to donating 5% of every uh, of the commission from every home they represent in Scarborough and an additional 1% 1% if it's a faculty member. And so um, they have been giving this, those checks as they make have those successful transactions. Um, and they continue to support our schools in other ways as well in terms of sharing their expertise and their knowledge and their relevance. I think, um, you know, they're... Uh, a young, um, smart, hardworking couple who wants to give back to their community, and I think it's something that's very common of millennials. Um, and he's also been involved with the internship program. I know that Christy Zabasnik had him come out to the high school and speak to students directly. They're really passionate about teaching students and adults about debt and credit <laughs> and college debt. Um, and that really comes from their experience as realtors and you know, sitting down with people at closing time or as they try to finance homes and realizing what they do and don't know about their own credit. And um, So he's passionate about that. They're both passionate about that as well. And they also, um, Tori has a five-year-old uh, five who's in kindergarten at Blue Point. So they're really invested in our community. And those are the kinds of partnerships we want to develop. Partners who share our values, who are invested in our vision um, and want to give back. The Scarborough Ed Foundation continues to be awesome in supporting innovation grants for our teachers. This year, um, up at the time we created the slide, we had received um, $22,584 in grants. Um, the recent grant cycle is fully funded again, so I don't have the total of that. Um, but I just heard from um, Seth last night that they fully funded their grants. and. Um, had a conversation with the principal today about some professional development needs and you know the first thing I thought of was like hey how about we write a grant for you know write a Seth grant and see if they will help us out um, they have been instrumental as Jody said last night and helping us continue to think creatively and innovatively and moving forward um, and really empowering teachers to take advantage of that opportunity even when we have tough budget years um, the Feinberg Trust continues to support the arts in our schools. Um, recently, Sue Ketch helped us install a, well, she didn't install it herself, I don't think, um, but helped coordinate the installation of a new case. If you've been to the high school auditorium, you'll see that there is um, some lovely photos and information about um, Mr. Feinberg, and, and there's a clarinet and a saxophone on display, and it's really beautiful. It's a tall wooden glass case with a red velvet. It's just really sharp looking, and I know that Sue used her artistic talents to help create that. We're also having our art show for the first time in eight years, 
96. Eight years. You've seen the posters popping up around town. They look great. We have um, 3.5 new, uh, new art teachers this year, and as they all came on board, we said you could have a job if you'll have an art show. Um, <laughs> really how it went. But, it was um, kind of like that, actually. <laughs> they have really stepped up uh, along with their um, uh, veteran colleagues to take on this enormous task of planning a K-12 district-wide art show, and we're so excited for that. Coming up May 7th through the 10th, there will be both visual and performing arts each day. It's from 8.30 to 7 each night, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 8.30 to 7, and then on Thursday, it closes a little early at 6.30, so they can start to take down and pack up all of the, the projects. Um, Monday night will be the big kickoff opening reception from 5 to 7. Uh, there will be live performances by our very talented students, um, some light refreshments and lots of beautiful art. I've been seeing them matting and prepping as I walk by their art rooms and um, I can't wait to see. It'll be in the alumni gym this year, so a little bit different if you're used to going to the plumber gym. Just take a left instead of a right. And um, we also have been able to supplement some of our other um, programs in the district this year through this um, trust in the way of bringing in um, like artists and residents. So we have a trumpet instructor that was funded through um, this trust. Did we do um, actually, I think we're paying for the flute instructor, but they're instrumental support for the band at the high school and um, in some cases at the middle school where they're, they're adding experts basically because um, although our individual teachers are you know, really gifted at playing different instruments and teaching different instruments, it's great to have somebody who is a flautist come in and teach the flutes or is a trumpet player come in and teach the trumpets. Um, so that's something that Feinberg's been able to do as well, and uh, the other piece is the Marimba project. Yes. And I don't know if you've heard us talk about that, but we've um, we've got a, a project where uh, Jacob Wolf, who is a marimba player, and I don't know if you know what a marimba is, but it's like a giant wooden xylophone. It's really cool. Um, and uh, Jacob is has been contracted with us to build marimbas for our school district. Um, but he's also an educator, and um, what he's done for us is to uh, film some classes and to show kids how they're constructed and how they're played and talk about the culture. Uh, so Chris Fletcher's working on that project, and it's been really exciting for me because I think marimbas are like the coolest thing. And I really, really want one. What's really cool about that project is that it's co-supported through two different creative funding sources. Right. So it's partly funded through SEF and partly funded through the trust. SEF gave uh, Chris a grant and then the trust gave him the other piece of it. So it's it's been a really nice collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have steel drums too. Uh, well, I don't know steel any drums. steel drum players, but we no, can we work don't. on that. We don't. Can we get them? Jack, oh, he wants them. <laughs> yes. e either Sue Catch or Joanne through Plus, the chair. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Oh, Jackie, oh, yeah. you gotta wait. You gotta wait, you gotta wait, wait. Jackie. <laughs> Write them down. Stay Put away. it on your sheet. It's All right, time for questions. So this <laughs> I've had my hand up. Sorry, look, hand. look, see? And everybody see? else oh, keeps talking. This. Everybody <laughs> keeps talking. It's true. Um, so <laughs> keeping with uh, the data-wise norms, um, this FY19 budget <laughs> for central go. office really there's nothing new besides increases for salaries and benefits. We've maintained the required and appropriate district-wide supports and services, um, working towards our long-range vision, vision for continuous improvement. Um, that's included in the exhibits, and we keep sharing it out in as many ways as we can, really trying to get the word out and getting people to um, connect with that big work that we're doing. And that vision um, has been in the district. It was formerly known as the 18-month plan and then became the 24-month plan, now rebranded as the long-range vision for continuous improvement because um, our work will never be done. We will just keep getting better. Um, one of the unmet needs, and this is not um, to discredit Kelly Johnson's work at all, it's really to highlight the fact that she has the amazing, um, challenging, probably impossible some days responsibility of supporting both Joanne and I. It's pretty unprecedented to have a superintendent and assistant superintendent sharing one administrative assistant. And when I first came to Scarborough and knew that that was the case, I was like, we do what? <laughs> and I think um, 
it's it really is remarkable that Kelly is able to support both of us at the level that she does. Um, but I worry that it may not be, and, and you, um, I, I worry about the sustainability of that and really um, as our work becomes more complex, you know, we, we need some more support in the central office um, and we need Kelly. So um, both those things. So that's one of our unmet needs. We did not talk about this really last year um, and we just want to put it on the radar that this is something that we're constantly thinking about and not necessarily just in the form of um, an administrative assistant, I think what really is needed is some sort of um, community relations or public, someone who has like a public relations background who can really help us with communication. Um, that's something that we're hearing loud and clear. People want more communication, more timely, and more different, a variety of ways. Um, and as much as I love to think about all the different ways to do that, I need someone to help execute on those things, or we need someone, I should say, to help execute on some of those things. And um, Kelly is also our chief communicator. She does 90% you know, of all of our communications in the district as well. So it is a, a lot for one person, and we're very lucky and fortunate to have her. So maybe it's really assistant for her. Um, yeah, <laughs> so. Assistant. Hmm. so this uh, last section, I'm going to pass around a summary. Um, you see there's a little note on there that says budget book page 63. We've been talking about capital projects um, little by little throughout this, this process, so there's, there's really no great news here. The one page uh, front and back summary there is just to give you the, the line items in the CIP budget. Um, there are individual descriptions of each project and equipment request um, starting on page 63. And so this slide is simply to say, here's what's made up, here's what our CIP budget is made up of. There are three sections. Um, Jen is here. Jen is um, here for the Foolishly to dis discuss her <laughs> capital budget Wait, if needed. Um, the tech refresh is district-wide this year, and um, there are a couple of items that Jen spoke to during her segment of this on April 5th. And um, Todd also spoke in general about his facilities projects, and most of those will look familiar to you. They're similar, um, uh, similar projects year after year, um, building envelope, HVAC, um, and roofing and flooring and all of the things that need to be maintained on a cycle over time. Um, there's one big item under facilities this year that's a standalone project, which is the um, reconfiguring of traffic flow at two of the K2 schools, which you heard about when uh, Todd spoke. And then transportation, we've got three buses um, in the CIP budget this year. We had three buses in the CIP budget last year. Um, the three buses this year, two of those will be um, requesting wheelchair uh, lifts, wheelchair access, and we'll have some flexibility in seating so that we can use them in different ways um, based on student needs. And um, there's a nice little story about why we replace buses in the budget book. Um, it really comes down to uh, saving money over time. And I think we've all probably had that vehicle in our lives that we're not really sure if we want to pour any more money into that one or if we want to scrap it and start over. There's always that breaking point where you're going to spend more money on repairs than you would if you went out and got a new vehicle. So we're lucky enough that we have Public Works taking care of this for us, keeping an eye on our vehicles, letting us know when one is reaching the end of its useful life and advising us as to how that turnover and that replacement cycle should go. And they do that for the entire town. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little highlight on this. Um, two things to know about this CIP budget in FY19. It, it's a total of $1.2 million. Last year was just under $1.4 million. So we're, you know, we're conscious of trying to keep those CIP requests as low as possible. Um, a little bit less than what we were looking for last year, but still keeping things moving and keeping things safe. And another thing to bear in mind is that the capital project budget that we're approving for FY19 doesn't impact the bottom line of spending in FY19. Debt service for those expenses 
Bonds won't be issued until the spring of 2019, and debt service for those um, expenditures will appear in the 2020 budget. Um, I should say, unless the town uh, finance office decides that some of that funding should be appropriated, which um, really I don't think has happened on our projects, but it has happened on some of the town projects. Jackie. Now's the time. Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to remind the board, and I, I don't know how, I don't remember the process, but when we have had art shows in the past, the board has purchased a piece of art, and that's where the art comes from in the superintendent's office upstairs. So, uh, who knows how that happens? Well, I, I've been thinking now. about Sue's got the permanent collection in her um, in, in her world, but that's really the high school's display, right? Yeah, each that's school I thought purchased. Mm -hmm. Sue, could you t talk a little bit about the permanent collection? So the permanent collection was started with the first art show um, as a way to start building an art gallery for the district and. So each phase, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, we purchase one piece of art. Over the summer, someone gets it framed and, and labeled and things, and it goes on display. And we chose the auditorium area because that's sort of an arts area in the building. And also, no matter what grade, our children come to that building for shows or performances or their own course concerts or things. So we thought that they all get to see their art in a central location like that. So even through the years that we haven't had the art show, we've still been adding to that collection every year. I, I reach out to the art teachers in the spring and say, don't forget to pull something. We give, um, for K2 and 3-5, we purchase an art book to go in their school library, and we put like a little nameplate that the book was purchased um, for the library to thank that child for the art. And we, we work with parents. We don't, like parents have to say it's okay for us to keep that art. We don't negotiate with the little guys. We parents, <laughs> parents say yes, it's okay. Um, at middle school and high school, we give them um, a Visa gift card um, in the amount of $75 for the middle school and $100 for the high school to thank them for purchasing the art, and um, and then the school pays for the frames and the matting and things, and um, and then they go on display. So as you can imagine, um, I think we did our first art show, you know, maybe 89 or 90, so you know, when you go through all those years, there's quite a collection, and um, it's not always 2D. In the display cabinet nearest my office in the auditorium, you will see ceramics and things um, that have also been purchased through the years, and they're in that cabinet um, as well. So it's quite a it's quite a beautiful collection. Um, we don't have the NIASC report from this time, but but the last time we had the NIASC report, it was one of the things they mentioned in the report as a highlight that. We um, do such a lovely job of permanently displaying and framing, so it really looks um, quite lovely. It's amazing what how a frame and a nice mat can really change um, a child's art into really being a beautiful piece of art. So we have kind of kept that going. Kate has quietly worked with me and helped me um, keep funding the framing and things and the, and the gifts to the children, the thank yous to the children to keep that going. And um, we will do that again this year. Um, I do wonder though, Jackie, because I remember we, we had a little refresh of the art upstairs um, a couple of years ago and brought in some nice new things. So maybe we need to like rotate some stuff up through upstairs too. Mm -hmm. Jen, were you going to add something? I just was going to say that um, one of the things I wanted to remind everybody of, and I think that we had talked about this before, um, is that we chose, we, we very carefully analyzed all of the maintenance reports from each phase level this year, and we chose not to do a wholesale refresh at any of the phase levels, because we felt like the devices had at least another life, another year of life left in them. 
So we are trying to make these devices last as long as possible before we just go out and replace them. So in this year's budget, there is no phase level refresh, um, and that's part of the reason, I think, for the for slightly lower, right, amount. the gross yeah. decrease. So yeah. for new board members, I can't remember um, off the top of my head what a refresh number is. Also, like five hundred. Typically five, 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 five yeah, five, five or six. Seven. It depends on the phase level because obviously the high school will be four grades, so that would be higher than a three grade level. Mm -hmm. Um, and it would depend on whether or not we needed to replace carts, wiring, cabling, you know, access points, projectors, whatever. That can also be rolled into that. But we, we um, felt like we could, um, Wentworth would have been the one that, the school that would have been up next year for a refresh, and we felt like we could get another year of life out of this HPs. And another thing to maybe mention is that um, when we do the refresh, we have asked families to pay fees now, and when we um, did the one-to-one -one initiative for the high school, it was a big part of the conversation was, you know, how much are families going to contribute in terms of maintenance fees, and how much of that is going to be available to us, so that when we do have a, a large refresh, like at the high school, will we have some money banked um, to to tap into? And um, at the moment, I was just going to take a quick peek here and see if I can find. Um, so that fee for people don't know if, at the high school that fee is sixty dollars per year per device, and um, thirty of that goes into a maintenance fund, and thirty of that goes into a rolling refresh fund. So we've got you know a hundred thousand dollars or so that is you know available for the refresh, and then we've got about the same amount right now that's available for um, for maintenance. So that helps as well. Definitely make contribution to that. Any other questions about nutrition, central office, or capital projects? I've got a couple of capital project ones. On the CTI phone upgrade, what is the life expectancy of the software once it goes in? Um, we put that in about five years ago. So, five years, there is an upgrade. Um, it came out, I think, late last year. Um, we opted to hold off to do it until we could get funding for it. We do have some funding that rolled forward from that original CIP on the town side. So we did not actually budget that into the CIP on the town side. It's on the school side. So we, it's a total of 20000 It's 10000 on each. And it's not a complete redo this time like it was five years ago, right? Or is five it years ago, it, it was, was a major we rolled out cable. We, yeah, we ran cable. We replaced all the phones. We the routers, the switches, the servers, everything. Yeah, and this it time it's huge. just an upgrade to the system. There are, you know, some hardware, back end hardware upgrades we'll have to make for that, but yeah, it's a fairly minor upgrade considering. My question was more is it, would it, is it less expensive to do the upgrades regularly or to do them all in one big hit? This is the first upgrade that's come out for the system, so the first major upgrade. I think there have been little kind of minor updates that we've done. This is the first major upgrade that they've had. So, it, yeah, we, it makes sense to just kind of wait, wait for it. Okay. And the backup appliance for the high school, is that a switch or a lane, and is that part of the disaster recovery? That is not part of the disaster recovery. That's our routine maintenance of hardware. Okay, yeah. thanks. We have some hardware that's aging. And it's not played. You guys talking code over there? <laughs> okay, can I ask one other question? I'm not sure if this is a, but I'm just curious. I know, I think it was last fall, was it last fall? We, I think the communications, we met with you and um, I forget the person's name who does the. Sean Bushman. Yeah. And he was talking about that you were maybe doing a systems change and that the web website would be updated. Is, is that still in play or is that going yeah. to be happening? So about uh, 13 months ago now, uh, Google announced that they were going to um, completely overhaul their platform, um, particularly for Google Sites. So they said, you know, within 18 months, um, the way they do it, I mean, part of it I think is because they're 
ginormous global conglomerate. So um, they kind of re release some of the functionality, get feedback from people all over the world, make a decision about what they're actually going to include, and then they repeat the process. So it's been this sort of pain painful, ongoing process of trying to find out what functionality is going to be included, what new functionality is going to be um, brought out, and then kind of the past functionality that's going to be brought forward. Um, so we've, we're still sort of waiting. There's a couple of key pieces for us because um, we did take the town Google this year too. So town and school are all Google together. We're all we're all Googling as one <laughs> together. Um, but to do that, we really need to um, swap out our intranet on the town side. And to do that, we're waiting on a couple of workflow pieces and, and other functionality pieces that we don't know if they're going to provide. So we're sort of in a holding pattern because since we're all Googling together, we have to sort of overhaul it all at once. And I think, Jen, I've been asked, and I, I think it's true that the school department's Google is a slightly different Google from the town's Google because we have the education version. Yes. Um, does that make any difference in terms of how we play together? Or? It's a different domain. So essentially, the, um, the school's domain is free. Right. Which so is the lovely. Free, love free. Right. The <laughs> municipal domain is not free. Um, so they are split into two different domains. So for example, when we get a district-wide site license for Adobe, we can't use those can't on the town them. side because they don't cross domains. Across the streets, so um, but there are other things in the back end, shared services wise, that we definitely you know take advantage of the shared services piece. I think the the new budget portal, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that sort of the new site version, or is that just something beautiful that Sean built on the old? That's something system. beautiful that Sean built based on the some feedback system. that we got from some other people of how they actually want to see the sites overhauled. So we kind of tested it that way to see, okay, like giant buttons, how does that He's work? He's kind of a genius, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so we, that, that may be part of kind of the new site what design like. moving forward. Yeah. But, but the great thing about Google is that even if we are two separate domains, you still can share documents back and forth and collaborate on things back and forth across domain or even with somebody's personal Gmail. That's the beauty of Gmail, why we wanted to get, or Google, why we wanted to get everybody out to G Suite. That's great. Plus it sounds cool. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. So, so far we've had five um, meetings, budget meetings, budget outreach meetings. Um, I think they've gone really, really well. Even the most recent one, um, there was four people in attendance, three repeat um, supporters or, or questioners, and one um, new person, but um, I still think that was worth our time. He asked a lot of questions and came prepared, had clearly looked at the budget materials and had seen our presentation from before, so um, we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. Um, we, are, I think we're done. We're not having any more. We agreed that it's just going to be the five this time, and then we're busy on the back end or behind the scenes working on those questions are going to be soon. Yeah, um, I did want to mention, I, I was talking with Larissa today, and um, as we were going around in the, in the community, we were saying to folks, we really want to get back to you with written responses on a lot of these questions. Larissa had committed to posting something on, on the website by the end of this month, which, which um, suddenly, about. suddenly <laughs> occurred to me that the end of the month is like in five minutes from now. So uh, we do have a chat this evening. She's going to go ahead and post what we have um, by uh, April 30th, but at, as Jen just pointed out, it's a Google Doc, it's live. We can go in and we can amend it, yeah. we can update it. And so she's gonna try to put something on there that says, you know, we're, we're still working on making sure that there's answers to all the questions, but here's the beginnings of that. Um, and, and, you know, I went in and did a few this evening, and we'll continue to keep chipping away at them. We've also collected a few questions that weren't part of the neighborhood meetings, um, you know, back and forth with emails, with um, folks from the community asking questions, and we're like, oh, that's a good question, we'll save that. So Julie and I, on another document, are just trying to save everything. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. since questions repeat, and um, typically people have some of the same wonders 
over time, maybe we can have something that we can share that's good for a lot of folks. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we wanted to spend just a couple of minutes and this kind of goes with our next slide, which is talking points, but on those talking points, we want to be able to include, like, what are the top five questions you're hearing? Do you feel like, you know, there's been repeated questions, or there's that question that somebody asked you, and you're like, yeah, that is a really good question. That is question. such a good question. Mm -hmm. Barb, can you try to capture these for us? On yeah. Thank you. You could put them onto the... Um, Sheet that Barb's got. She's got the talking points document linked in here. Oh, that's right. Right? Yeah. On the, um, from the last meeting from April 5th, we had collected a few ideas. Julie? Oh, banana. I'm just kind of talking out loud on this one, but. I feel like there's kind of an old-fashioned idea about education. And I don't know how to put that into the question to you, except that from the questions that I heard, there's really not an updated sense of what school is all about. Um, yeah, we kind of tackle so, that in little pockets, like things right. like, you know, I, I was thinking of Joanne's presentation earlier about what school nurses do. Yeah, And, exactly. you know, it's, and I, when I was in school, the school nurse gave us aspirin, and yeah. it was, she was super nice. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, I mean, there's, there, in every area of education, it's changed so much, and yet people yeah. may still not have caught up with that. Exactly, I mean, when you think of so many different things, even over the past 10 years, about how education has changed, whether you're looking at the behavioral issues, including the autism things, and then the, you know, the, the, the adult ed stuff, and the social media issues, the medical issues, and even in 10 or 12 years, it's just amazing how things have changed in schools. Well, and expectations and for what to, students can learn at, at an age. Yeah. But are these, these are, I thought, the top five questions that we got at those meetings. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, say, that's why I'm just <laughs> thinking out loud to you about it. So right. right. How do you turn it into a question? Yeah. So how do you, you turn that into a question is... No, but like these are questions you, that people are asking us. That yeah. they had from that us. That they had already. Us created. That we've heard already. Yeah, exactly. So one of them, for example, was the adult ed question. Why isn't it a self-sufficient program? Because when you ask them, well, what are you thinking about what it is, what then they do? explain this really old-fashioned idea about what the heck it was, you know, <laughs> what it used to be years ago. And so I what don't know if it's kind of like whether we need to be doing at those outreach sessions a more of a a little bit of an introduction about school, or I'm not quite how to, sure how to get there to bring people along. So I think that's a different conversation. I think, I think what tonight, and forgive me because I'm like sort of just spent at this point. I think we just need to stick with what are the five top questions that came out of those meetings that the public had that we need to focus on for this budget. I think your conversation, it's, I think it's correct in that librarians have changed, teachers have changed, school nurses have mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. I think that's a different conversation, a different workshop. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, maybe that's more of a communication strategy, mm -hmm. of sort of like a did you know series or. Um, and so we have a communication meeting on Monday or Tuesday, so yeah. Yeah. we'll take that on. We'll take okay. that. Yeah. It's yours. <laughs> no, so, okay. I know One of the questions I heard a couple of times was, um, "Why do we need three three new buses every year?" Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good one. I've seen that one. I think that, I think that is good because I think you sort of over time wonder, well, at some point we have to catch up. Right. Mm -hmm. and, right. Like, and why think, is it every year? And, but, I think, it, but there yeah. is a, an interesting story right. that I think Kate... Well, do you think the question is, why are there three buses every year and not two buses? Or why are there no. three buses every year Why, are you at why do we buses? need to buy three new buses every year? Why can't we use the ones we have? What's wrong with the ones we've got? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. 
We got a really good question. Make yeah, sure you tell them how many correct. buses we have. Well, that's yeah. yeah. That's yeah. part of it is the math. How many buses do you have? How many years do they? How many years are they good? How many miles they have on them? It's the yeah. same thing with our tech refresh. It's the mm -hmm. same sort of. Right. Why do you? It's the same thing with the pickup. Question. When are you done? Why are we buying a pickup? When are you, know, you done? Like, right? And you're not done yeah. because it's cyclical. So, so yeah, that's a good one. Another question that I heard. I don't know if this is going to be like <laughs> a top five, but um. Sorry. Be, well, you moved me down. I'll move back up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you were not on the same page. I think it's because changing. it's oh. on this one pager. Uh -huh. well, I, got, I got a couple questions about what does this mean? Redesign educational technicians to year round. What, I mean, um, I have the I had the answer to that one, but it was a. I, I've heard it a few times, and I think it's because we highlighted it. Because we yes. said, what, here's what we're doing, right. and so now we need to get more so, in depth about what that is. So I don't is. know if that makes the top five, but it is one that I heard a couple times. Well, what's cool about that is we have a document that talks all about it, so we can link that in. And a very yeah. great visual. And some, you know, some really nice material that's already written that we could just link mm -hmm. into the yep. questions. I so think that is, did you catch that one, Barb? No, what was that? That was... What's um, going on with the tech... Uh, what is it called? Tech support. The Redesign the, the educational IT technicians to year-round IT positions. Mm -hmm. It's on this. I have a position, not a question so much. I think we need to explain succinctly to the public what we have done in the last year. Uh, that, that makes us more efficient. Oh, that was a question, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So what have we done in the last year that makes us more efficient? Ooh. At the meeting that I was at, they asked specifically what, are, are you challenging your department heads to save, a, cut a certain percent mm -hmm. a, a, every year or that yeah. sort of thing? And I think that goes along with the question that I got that was, what are you doing to think outside the box to, mm -hmm. um, Fund. I would I would put that one as a separate one. What are you doing to think outside the box to fund things? Like one of them is reducing costs and one of them is alternate revenue. Right, right, I guess. The one thing I keep I've heard I heard this year and then I think I've heard the last few years is um, why don't you do like a three year projection? We had a hard time doing a one year projection. projection. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> now the two-year projection we threw out and started over, but we, you know, we could certainly articulate that, and talk about why that's difficult. There's been a lot of questions about fund balance. I'll tell you another one. Yeah, fund balance. Oh, hold on. Why right. do we no, pay our employees competitive yeah. salaries? Yeah, wait a second. Leanne's trying to ask Let's something. Jackie, to go ahead and I'll go after. Yeah. So, okay, go ahead, sure. Jackie. Bye. Why do we pay? Well, why do we want to pay our employees competitive salaries? <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Well, I did see one about are our salaries competitive, and, and what do you yeah. do yeah. to find oh, that okay. out? So it's sort of the same yeah. idea, right? Mm -hmm. right? Well, we I had a similar similar question to the one you were at, but people were not upset. I mean, people were like, okay, we are not the best paid, we're not the worst paid, we're competitive. And I think pretty much everyone in the room was cool with that. Yeah, I think they um, were interested to see how do we how do we negotiate? Right, like what's the right? process to do get you there? Compare how do we to other, that out? Like yeah. you know, do what kind of like pre work do you do before you get to the table? Right. Kind of stuff. Um, yeah. I can answer that question. Um, yeah. Leanne's going to just throw ask a question right? now. <laughs> Everybody, Leanne has the floor. Um, there, there's a lot of questions about the fund balance, yeah. how it's calculated, um, how long it can last, and why do we have it. And why do we use it? Yes. Why do we yeah, use it? I've got a pretty decent document about that that I, I think I started to share with one of you guys, and then I, I didn't ever refresh it. So that's a good one. Fund balance, how's it used, what's it for, what the heck is it, right? Yep. And I don't think we want this list to be 10 questions. No, I'm just, I just think we should then go back and say, okay, <laughs> I was just kidding. Which one's going to be Because I think that's, that's part of the, the challenge, mm -hmm. I'll say, is right. that we then just like start so much. It's, it's so much, much information. Right. Like, well, and we have so, um, probably, I don't know, 75 questions or so. Some of them are sort of repeats or some of them are, right. you know, and some of them are one question, you know, it's a sentence because blah, 
and right. some of them is, you know, paragraph. But that's different because that's saying, okay, here's all the questions we heard and we're answering them in this form. This is more like, here's the top five questions, like hand handout almost. Right, right. Like, and, and, and what are the things that resonate with you guys? You know, what are you hearing where, like Julie right. said, you can go, oh, that's a good question. If I could answer that one, I really feel like it would make a difference in, in people's understanding. Mm -hmm. So I think if it was me, I would take out the first one. Maybe I think that's too, too specific. Mm -hmm. Well, and I didn't really hear it. All right, so why don't I mean, we just I, strike through it, Barb? So it's there, but we're saying that's not. I'm our just top saying line. we're trying to get it down to five. Right. And, and remembering that, that it off. will be answered in some way because it will be answered in the you know response to the right. all right. of and, the questions. And we have the answers if somebody mm -hmm. asks us specifically, but this is like a generalized. Mm -hmm. I think number eight is probably the, one of the top questions. I agree. I would keep that for sure. Go to format text. I think number yeah, seven is text. can probably be taken. Oh, there it is. Thank yeah. you. It's a race. Did we strike through it? It's a race. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Stop googling <laughs> each other. We were getting there eventually. We're all googling. I would. I, I don't think seven needs to be on there. That's not a top question. But anymore. there, it, you could be rewriting that a little bit about you know how do we determine. Or there were a lot of questions about negotiations. Well, like these questions, are, though, are about captured salaries. from your meetings. True, I'm sorry, I'm contradicting captured? myself. Yes. Right, I'm not saying yeah. we're not, we don't answer these questions or we don't right. know it's the not answers. The I'm just saying on. they're not the top five, yeah, like, right, right. like, burning well, questions of the community. I think it's, the question I hear more is, how, how do our salaries compare? Yeah. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, like, are they competitive? Mm -hmm. And I'd almost make the argument because it's such a large amount of money, if we're talking 75% of the budget is salaries, mm -hmm. that may be but something that's a to big help. impact, right? Yeah. 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 Then I would keep it to how, right, how, I would keep it how as does B. the salary compare? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a visual. I agree. Yep. Yeah. I'm cool with that. I, I think if we're talking about this year's budget That's specifically, I think <laughs> that the <laughs> IT this is position is a good one. Well, and, and particularly, as you said, because it's on our one pager, right. and if That's you know, people are reading through that and going, yeah, I know what a classroom teacher is. And right, know kindergarten what teacher's got it, required services got it. Can we, on that one pager, can we just rewrite that so it's a little more information there so that it's mm -hmm. just a little clear or there's not enough room there. It's kind of complex. Oh okay. I think. Yeah, I didn't know. I was oh, like eh, I, I wonder uh, but we could we could leverage our Google -less, Google -less <laughs> and and we could uh, put that one pager and then have a link in it yeah. that goes live to the backup material for it. <laughs> It doesn't help the person who. Because that like, seems like an e that like, seems like an easy one to explain. You know what I mean? It's right. I don't know. Does it doesn't feel like a burning budget question as much as just I don't understand what that is. You doesn't know? the budget book have a diagram that Jen did on? Jen's got a whole section in her in the town part of it of the budget book, and then there's she pulled that out for us. Um, I think it's a, actually it's a, an exhibit in the budget. Book. <laughs> we have about seven minutes with us. We sure do. I not that I don't think it's important uh, that we have done things in the past year to make us more efficient, but I'm not sure that it's relevant to next next year's budget as much as the other thing. I mean. Like keep the think outside the box writing, right. right? But get rid of the what have you what have you done last year to make like that's work? last you know like I feel like well, that's maybe something that that's like a retrospective as a, as a, as opposed to a looking forward to the and again it will budget. still be answered it's just not going right. to be a top five. Okay. Would it be more top five if it were um, sort of flipped to say you know do you look for efficiencies in your operations? Or is that not really a question? Well, number five, could, you could answer that in number five. What are you doing to think outside the box? Like You could, you could fold that into number five. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. You could, well, you could combine it. What are you doing to think outside the box to fund things and be more efficient? Right. Yeah. yeah. You could yeah. Kind of right. And then you could cut costs and, and yeah. find yeah. alternatives. Yeah. 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 So just add and be more efficient. Talk about the curtailment. See, what you're doing yeah, here is you're making two questions into one, which is cheating. Cheating. <laughs> We've been accused of that before. Okay, do we feel like this, why do we need three buses each year as a keeper? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. And we think this one, why did we redesign the ed tech positions? I think because it's on our one pager, yeah. it's a good one to have. Okay. Um, what about this? Why don't we do a three year projection? I can take that out. Yeah. Just take that one out. There are some people who are really passionate about that, but I'm not yeah. sure how widespread that is. Right, yeah. yeah, I think it is a, a small it's group a that asks everybody. Right. Right. So so there's there's your, your top five questions. questions. Like we've said before, it's, it's still it's not like we're not answering the other questions. These are just right. Right. we'll still answer them. We just won't exactly. focus on them and bring them forward so ourselves. One, two, and this three. is really to get you thinking no, about also. Five. Five. Can you have a sign down? down. Yeah. Write down every Four, question that's asked. Seven seven eight, 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 eight. Eight. Okay. Um, <laughs> at the public hearing? Okay, well, you know I sit there with my notebook and I take notes the whole time, so I'll do that. So the other thing we want to be thinking about is um, what content do we want on the June 1 mailer? Um, and so remember, our initial aim was for this to be like a half pager. There's not much content you can put on that. We might want to think about is it something that is a foldable, a folded mailer that opens up, so it's still one piece of paper, but it gives you a little bit more landscape, or is it an actual like postcard? Um, I don't know the cost differences between the two, but one of the things we heard loud and clear last year was people want a mailer, mm -hmm. and so the intent is that it is like in your mailbox by June 1, and it's like the get out the vote reminder. Mm -hmm. um, it's also what to come out and vote for, and has mm -hmm. some like bottom line numbers on that, which we won't have until after the second reading, but we should be thinking about design. And um, since we have people who are experts in marketing on this team, I think that maybe <laughs> communications and finance coming together or um, thinking together about what that might look like would be a good strategy for that, but I wanted to see what thoughts you had. Yep. And I think as people have ideas, maybe emailing to Hillary as the communications chair or... Hey, yeah, that's fine. I can, I can mm -hmm. spearhead that. And sort of... Get another share Google Doc going. Yeah. So, uh, are we well allowed to have... We can't have, like, a joint communication with the finance committee, right? Can't we? Yeah. Oh, we can. We just, we just have the public side. Yeah. yeah. So, maybe that's something that we should aim for. Like, everyone do ideas, talk. A, a joint meeting would only be... Like, because okay. Jody oh, yeah, and I right. carry over right. the phone. It, it was just, just adding Leanne, Leanne. <laughs> right, okay. You'd have so one, then that's easier get... than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> you would get a quorum, so you have to gross. make it a meeting. Oh, but if you're so thinking so about timing, nice. and I don't know what um, access you have to, like, printing resources or who we want to think about for that, but the turnaround time from the second reading, the second reading's May 16th, our second reading's May 17th, you pretty much have to have something ready to go yeah. mm -hmm. at that point so that we're sending right. it so off on the 18th and, to and be that's printed. Good. That's mm -hmm. close. That's yeah. like super tight. Based on stuff I've done before. That's wicked yeah. close. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we add that to look into it so we can do this? Yeah. Well, like, we, go, we can yeah. buy local on that. That would be. We have uh, a gentleman who did the posters for the art show who gave us a really good price and is a Scarborough parent. Um, it's Waterfront. Printing? No, Maybe. it's. What's the name of it? Yeah. I'd have to look it up. I, think uh, I can look it up. I'm right here. It's not water, but I don't think. Um, the magic box will tell me. All right, so send that to Hillary because we're meeting on. Are we meeting on Monday? Yes. Monday. Okay. <laughs> what time are you meeting? Two to two. All right. Not that we couldn't get quotes from other places, but I just happened to know that this person was very supportive. I know I'm going back a little bit, but mm -hmm. we only have one audience member. Can we just ask? I don't know if you have yeah. any questions. If you, like you, looking at our five questions, if you had anything that jumped out at you. And I don't want to put you on the spot. If you don't have anything to ask, don't feel Well, I, I thought the point that, that like Donna, uh, Mrs. Bailey, sorry, was trying to bring up was that it was a valid one. I think there's a lot of older people in the community that don't really understand what is being taught in school. And when you talk about the school purchasing 3D printers and other things, they look and go, what? I thought school was just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, mm -hmm. Why am I being charged in my taxes to pay for a 3D printer? Um, why am I being charged for these? They grew up in a time where you know, school was, I got slapped on the wrist if I did something wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty binary. You learn education, you learn who the individuals were the, in the office. And school's a lot different than that nowadays, and that's where they really struggle to understand 
where some of the line items that they look at, and they, well, well, I never had this at school. We had shops. We bought pieces of wood and built things. So mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if, if, I think there is a question there that, I, I don't know if you want to make that public, but there is a, a portion of the population that most likely wants that answer for them. Mm -hmm. um, it is, school's a lot different. What if we did like a series? Right, like I feel sort. like that's a such a broad. Yeah, um, that's a really. Yeah, you're like. I think you're, it's a really right, good idea. You, that's a lot of things to tell people about, well, right? Because you, it's not just three, you know it's three D printers and the nurses do different things and like it's, it's, is in the life right. It's like out. so widespread that maybe it's and not like a top five question. It, you can explain to them through math, right? They learn math. Three D printing is mathematics, right? You're using calculus. You're using. Um, Right. You're using calculus, you're using derivatives, things that students are learning in school because you take the shape under the curve and you, and you uh, I forget off the top of my head, you do integrations around it. But if you can explain to them that a 3D printer is just a way for them to visually show the mathematics that they're doing, right? You did it on a piece of paper in school, it was hard for you to understand. Well, for example, we bought the 3D printer so the student could do out the math or whatever shape they wanted to create, and the printer does it. And that's just an example of a way to potentially present it to someone like that. Because, um, you know, to them, 3D printers, it, it, you never saw this ever coming, right? 3D printers, the fact that science is printing parts, printing all sorts of things nowadays, it, it, it's tough for them to see. I think, actually, you have a good idea. I think that if we did it example-based, you might know for specific like now, things, oh, that's like, right. Right. like oh. this, the three D printer. That's a specific example of something that's <laughs> super high tech, and this is what it's teaching you. And, and then find existed. another example of something that you know. So use like have it be example based. Of, yeah, like then could we have the students? I know this might be too much for the amount of time we have, but it'd be so neat to have the students showing it. You know, having yeah. a video and having the students saying. I do this right. so I can, that'd be Dylan, that can be your next project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. At one point we were talking about like going to um, retirement yeah. communities exactly. or the library yes. and showing, full time, full time. We, we were thinking about it as showing episodes of Inside yes. Scarborough Schools, but, but also inviting students or somebody along with us so we could mm -hmm. either do it, yeah. do it that way or we could have, um, if students wanted to make video projects and then come or yeah. even better have a teacher come or right. whatever to answer questions and host little open houses or go to the places where people are. And a good an example mm -hmm. uh, when you're working with older people is uh, persuasive writing. When they were a kid and they did a persuasive writing, then they had to take a newspaper and today they can go online and get newspapers from around the world to do a persuasive right. writing. You know, and that mm -hmm. kind of puts a lot it of really why laptops give students okay. another perspective in how to uh, so get we can, information. <coughs> we can talk about that in communication. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's an opportunity. The library, the public library is always asking, uh, mm -hmm. offering to do partnerships yeah. and yeah. work with us. Like, yeah. it would be That's a cool idea. little um, a good idea. series. That's a good idea. Series. Series. They play that can stay there in a series mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. different. I like the display idea at the library because that gets a lot of use by you know yeah. wide range of people. Yeah. But also even on even an evening or a Sunday afternoon, when right? People go. To, they they often host some of these events over there where a lot of people come to to, to learn something just for a couple of hours. You know, I mean that would be a really cool thing to be what it was and what it is now. That could be just such a nice multi generational yeah. event. Well, you know, yeah. to have some older folks talking about how they and you know it's almost like the carousel in progress at Disney. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not even kidding. It's actually my favorite ride. Yeah, that's what we need. Uh, anyway. It's the Scarborough Carousel of yes. Progress. We have one more minute, minute until so wrap up. Things are coming for real. Jack, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that and we've discussed this before but not in depth. That, that maybe starting the 1st of May that we have a, a, an hour or an hour and a half period every Friday afternoon visit your neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. And we have children available to, to take the, whomever around well, and I, I don't care if it's a kindergarten child 
or a high school senior, but it should be the same time every week at every school and people should be welcomed in to see what is going on. We talked about that too, actually. A long time ago, right? Um, yeah, that's a good idea. We can talk about that again. I don't know if that falls under communications or not, but. Mm -hmm. Probably more school department. Some logistics, but I, you know, yeah. it might work. Maybe nobody comes. Who knows? I think that's a great way to help get a deeper understanding of all kinds of things, mm -hmm. proficiency-based education, mm -hmm. the writing, the reading, mm -hmm. I mean, all of the work that, we're do that we've been working on, and for people to understand the complexity of the teaching role. Too. I think we have some evidence of that, That's effectiveness good. of that, when we opened Wentworth, because we had a lot of people mm -hmm. from the community come in and see the building, and in doing so, they saw, right. you know, the special ed equipment they, for kids with severe disabilities. Mm -hmm. They saw, oh, wow, you have a room for OT? Oh, gosh, you have a 3D yeah. printer? Um, and it worked you know, there was well a lot of really office. neat sort of eye openers for folks who, who took the time to take those tours. It worked very well in the old school to get them to understand why we needed how terrible school. it was yeah. <laughs> when they saw some of the equipment that mm -hmm. was in schools today for some kids, and yeah. also some of the rooms that were being used for classrooms. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that should be happening, I tell you, I was absolutely blown away and fascinated when that third or fourth year old boy was in the learning commons at Wentworth and showing how to use that whiteboard. Honest to goodness, it just, <laughs> it just blew you right away. my socks <laughs> off. All right. How did the meeting go? Well, it's not bad, though. Not bad. We lost our time. We're five minutes. Ahead of we so now we have well we have three minutes to do this. What we gain time in the beginning and then we lose a little bit as we go. <laughs> yeah. But you have to keep in mind that to get to the nine thirty we did shave time off hoping the beginning would go faster. And I think I felt like people were more aware of where we were in the agenda. And I I felt that's because aware. there was progress over the last. Jody is on I data time. <laughs> time. <laughs> She's like, I'm sorry. Delta. Delta. Jody needs uh, data wise. <laughs> I have to look at my bag. <laughs> I think we should just go around the table and then people don't get interrupted. Jackie, you start. Well, I'm sorry that Dylan. Didn't, didn't have anything to say this evening, but he, he tells me that he's been educated, so <laughs> I'm happy with that. That's pretty broad. I know. <laughs> Dylan did say that he thought the budget book was interesting. Really? Yeah, wow. I, I, I read the budget, believe it or not. Wow. And oh, right. it <laughs> was Did not you like bad. the did you know? I, well, yeah, I, actually, like that I think you said you, not bad more than I like that in the budget, <laughs> you, you include like each department's report and budget together, so you're kind of getting information on what's happening and also like sneaking on all the facts that you're trying to convince people to pay for. Not sneaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Artfully placed. Yeah. Fully um, I thought we did pretty well in data wise time. I'm too chatty and I realize that, but um, I thought this was very productive, a lot of great engagement. I can't believe how tired we all are and yet we're really in there pitching, so good for us. Pass. Pass? Yeah. Are people passing? Yeah. Why are people passing? Because I already said it. I'll turn. I, I love this format, ladies. Nice and done. It's right up my alley. I love knowing the time constraints on everything. Get her done. I love that we're working towards being more efficient. And I would like some feedback from one of the last deltas about so much information at once. Did you like the shorter time frame? This yes. time where we did six departments. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the meeting. Yeah. I feel like you can absorb more and you can go a little deeper. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
I think it made sense to do the three, you know, like Joanne's presented three at once and central office and the, uh, they got lumped together. And I think for this size group, especially, that worked well. I think for a, a really big group, that might not have. Okay. That was something we did do because we knew people would be tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but pass. 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 I just said it. Yeah, no, I, I really like, I do like the format thing, so people already said that, but I, but I like it and I think it's, mm -hmm. and I just like the discussion. I just like the open discussion. Like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I like it. So much more fun without that. I do like that you changed the intros to be shorter and the questions to be longer because that's clearly the way we all <laughs> yeah, it's very good. I'm not really going to have even more. Uh, <laughs> um, Donna, I yes. just want to mention that I, I've already posted the slide deck on the budget portal because I'm trying to just do it like, right now and we're all so efficient. Um, so it's out there. Um, the public can access it in there. And there are links in it, just like there are in the, in the presentation. So people can go in and see the agenda. They can go and see our notes. So it's all right there. Anybody else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So sure. moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> that was a quick second. Second. <laughs> Thank you. We are adjourned.